It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Many religious believers live their entire lives without learning much about other people's faith. Maybe some people avoid interreligious dialogue because they think they already know their religion's true. Maybe some people fear that such exchanges might somehow change them and they don't want to change. In this episode, we're joined by Catherine Corneal, a Catholic theologian at Boston College and an enthusiastic supporter of interreligious dialogue. We're talking about her book, The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue. If you've ever wanted to know how to improve your conversations with people of different faiths, or even with people within your own faith who see things differently, this episode's for you. Corneal identifies some of the behaviors we can cultivate when talking to people who see things differently. She says interreligious dialogue can teach us so much about other religions, but also so much about our own faith. Special thanks are due to our friends at Brigham Young University's Wheatley Institution, who invited Dr. Corneal to deliver last year's Truman G. Madsen lecture on the Eternal Man. A link to that lecture is available at our blog. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. Catherine Corneal joins us. She's the author of The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue. Is it okay if I call you Catherine? Of course, Okay, yes. Catherine, thank you for being on the Maxwell Institute podcast today. You're welcome. I wanted to start off by asking you how you first became interested in interreligious dialogue in general. I studied theology at the Catholic University of Louvain and had a few courses in non-Christian religions. And at the time, I was quite fascinated, especially by... Asian religions and wanted to learn more about those traditions and realized that there was very little that religions communicated explicitly between one another. And so from that time on, I, I realized that there were a number of things that I had been learning from Hinduism and Buddhism that could enrich Christian the Christian tradition and Christian faith. And so that's really the beginning of how I became interested in questions of interreligious dialogue. Do you come from a religious background yourself? I do. I grew up Catholic. I'm a Catholic theologian. And uh, I think in particular, the fact of continuing to identify with a particular religious tradition while opening oneself up to others and all of the questions and problems that that uh, brings with it is really what I have been fascinated with for uh, for a very long time. Hmm. What's your most basic definition of interreligious dialogue? What is interreligious dialogue? Yeah, I use a rather broad definition of interreligious dialogue as any form of constructive engagement between members of different religious traditions. So interreligious dialogue can just be sort of friendly exchange between people from different religions. It can be collaboration between members of different religions on social projects, or it can be, you know, theological engagement between religious traditions or what we call comparative theology. So I use the term interreligious dialogue in this kind of broad umbrella sense of any constructive engagement between religions. And I guess the people involved are usually dependent on what the particular tradition looks like, right? So what, what type of people, who's actually doing interreligious dialogue? Yeah, so if, if, if the definition is so broad, um, interreligious dialogue goes on implicitly or explicitly, maybe on a daily basis between people who don't even think of what they're doing as interreligious dialogue. But then as a scholar, I look at what is happening in society where societies are becoming much more pluralistic and people willingly or unwillingly have to live together and find a way to coexist. So that the very coexistence, peaceful coexistence and attempt to overcome tensions and so on are all forms of interreligious dialogue. From a Catholic tradition, you're, you know, women are in the Catholic Church aren't ordained, so you're coming to this as a, as a woman theologian but not a clergy member. Mm -hmm. What contexts then can you engage in? Um, who do you talk to? And do you represent the Catholic Church or just a theologian's perspective when you do it? Well, I try to represent the tradition. To call it the church per se is maybe too narrow, but I try to engage people from other religious traditions theologically from within the theological background of my own tradition. So I'm not an official representative of the Catholic Church in dialogues with others, but I mean, that's only a very sort of narrow form of dialogue, I would say, where you know, church leaders engage in sort of photo ops together where <laughs> they show hands. their yeah, they show their goodwill 
to each other, and that's very important, I think, but it's not sort of the dialogue that also changes traditions and changes people's hearts. It does, maybe, just to see your leaders, you know, speaking with each other and collaborating is important, but I'm looking for a deeper kind of dialogue where theologically traditions can possibly learn things from each other, and so that's where my engagement in interreligious dialogue comes in. It's really more of a an in-depth theological study of another tradition to see what one can possibly learn from that tradition and maybe also offer to the other tradition. What do you think motivates the sort of photo op type of interreligious dialogue? M maybe we could put scare quotes around interreligious dialogue for those yeah. type of opportunities that you say also have some benefits as well, though. So what do you think motivates those kind of surface level opportunities? Well, I think, you know, religious leaders are very well aware also of the fact that religion has been sort of a force for good, but also for evil in terms of the tensions that have existed historically between religious traditions. And so for them to show a kind of friendship or collaboration, I think, is important for their members also to realize that one doesn't have to approach the other as the enemy or have sort of uh, feelings of fear for people from other religious traditions. So all of those elements are very important. And within the Catholic tradition, Pope John Paul II was very instrumental when he organized days of peace in Assisi, uh, bringing together major leaders of uh, the religious traditions to pray together for peace. And so I think all of those events are important, but in some ways short-lived. They happen and then, you know, people go back to their own traditional ways. And what we are trying to do theologically is something a little bit more sustained and enduring, hopefully. What's an example of maybe the most astonishing example of one of those surface-level interreligious engagements that you can remember in, in your lifetime? Is there one that sticks out to you as, wow, I, I never thought these people from these traditions would come together like this? Yeah, I don't know if there was anything particularly astonishing. I do remember actually once I responded to a panel where leaders and thinkers of the Mormon Church and the Evangelical Church came together at the American Academy of Religion. And I was a uh, respondent to the, the dialogue that went on between those two groups. Mm -hmm. And I found that really fascinating. And uh, as a result of that, I also included that, that dialogue in my Blackwell Companion to Interreligious Dialogue. I think many of the other dialogues have sort of grown slowly. And this is, a, I think, a dialogue that's really quite new and visceral and passionate in the sense of uh, both traditions having very strong convictions and yet uh, being able to speak to one another. You mentioned the book that you edited, the, the Wiley Blackwell Companion to Interreligious Dialogue. Um, I haven't reviewed that before the interview, but I wonder does it kind of cover the general type of issues that are usually addressed in interreligious dialogue, or what does that book do? There are two parts to the book. The first part are critical topics in interreligious dialogue, so general issues of the history of interreligious dialogue, conditions for dialogue, women and dialogue, inter spiritual dialogue, and so forth. Uh, the second part of the book are concrete cases of dialogue. So I tried there to cover a wide swath of dialogues between Confucianism and Islam, between Hinduism and Judaism. So all kinds of different cases of the history of dialogue between particular religions. Hmm. In the book, The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue, uh, and that's spelled I-M with a dash between possibility, the impossibility of interreligious dialogue, you talk about kind of broad general issues that usually get addressed. You break them down into spiritual practice, doctrine, and ethics. Talk about that categorization for a moment. Yeah, so those are different foci of interreligious dialogue. And what I try to make clear is that each type of dialogue has a different set of conditions, and that the conditions that I develop in the book mostly have to do with the more uh, theological uh, dialogue. 
Yeah, so the book is laying out these five essential conditions that make interreligious dialogue worthwhile or some of the benefits or, or that make it work, I guess. It's almost the, the oil in the engine that kind of helps it run. Before we dig into those individually, you also offer an important caveat here. You say that religious believers, they have to find their deepest motivations for doing interreligious dialogue within their own traditions. You're very clear on saying you can't try to convince someone to participate in interreligious dialogue using reasons that their tradition doesn't already value. Yeah. So because dialogue has become such a fashionable word and attitude in uh, the encounter of religions today, I think it's important to think critically about dialogue and to realize in the first place that religions are not naturally inclined or oriented to dialogue. So dialogue is in, in some ways somewhat artificial. Each religion believes itself to be the highest tr truth, the ultimate truth, sometimes even the, uh, the only truth. So it, unless believers can find the motivation and the reason for dialogue within their own texts or within the, their, the interpretation of their own text, dialogue will never have any result of any significance. So that's why I emphasize the need for every religion to find within it themselves the reasons for dialogue. And those reasons are not necessarily given. As I say, religions are not necessarily by nature oriented to dialogue. So it's all a matter of interpretation of the tradition that allows people to open themselves up to, to other religious traditions. So in that sense, hermeneutics or hermeneutics interpretation of their own texts and traditions are uh, are essential. Yeah, hermeneutics is a word that you bring up early on and you define it for the reader. It's basically a fancy word for interpretation. And you say that this is a really crucial tool that people can use when talking with other people from other religious traditions, but also to think about their own religious traditions. It seems to be a reminder to people that their own religion is something that they have received, but also something that they interpret and that they can interact with creatively almost. Would you say creativity is an important part of hermeneutics? Yeah, I, I would say so. I think it's a matter of always understanding the text from a particular place and interpreting it always in light of uh, particular circumstances. So hermeneutics is based on the idea that there is no one fixed meaning to the text that is unchanging, that the meaning of a text is always a matter of a dialogue between the text and the reader. And that in that sense, the reader also always gives meaning to a particular text. If we look at the history of religions, you know, religious texts tend to be themselves so diverse and so rich internally. Often it's a matter of which passages does one focus on, mm -hmm. which passages does one select for guidance and so forth. So the hermeneutics I have in mind is also trying to find within the texts or within the tradition sources that might open up the tradition to others rather than close them up. Every reader comes to a text from their own position and interprets it. And you talk about how texts don't, they don't necessarily have this self-manifesting meaning once for all time. They're always interpreted. So what restrains hermeneutics then? Some people raise the objection of relativism. Well, texts can mean anything then. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you engage in hermeneutics from within a particular religious tradition, that tradition itself is what constrains the possibility of interpretation. So in theology, there are certain limits to orthodoxy, uh, certain limits to interpretation that are often not necessarily given in the text themselves, but the, but determined in conversation among interpreters, among people engaged in constructive engagement with the, with the text. So I think it's a matter of trial and error often, where you try some or you explore certain possibilities, and then the tradition itself decides whether it is within the bounds of orthodoxy or not. Some traditions have more clear sort of boundaries and authority structures that decide on what is and what isn't orthodox and other traditions are somewhat more loosely defined. But it's always a matter of, I would say, conversation among 
those who are trying to remain faithful to the text and trying to adapt it to uh, contemporary realities and circumstances. Within Catholicism in particular, is there a sense in which revelation plays a role there, like where the community of interpreters... Um, it, it's not necessarily democratic, right? Like you don't have all the all Catholics and all Catholic leaders line up and then vote on what they want to happen per se. There's also a sense in which interpretation can be restrained by the idea of the spirit working with the tradition. Is that accurate about Catholicism? Yeah, the, there's certainly sort of a sense of historical development of doctrine, and that's connected to the idea of the continuing presence of the spirit in, in the world. In the Catholic tradition, there's also what's called the census fidelium, where the community of believers in their consensus of the meaning of particular text or how to apply it or not to contemporary circumstance has a voice mm -hmm. in, in the process of interpretation. But ultimately, it's the magisterium of the Catholic Church that decides whether some theological proposal fits within its own self-understanding or not. So there there is a very clear sort of authority structure that can uh, condemn that can investigate and condemn certain theologians for saying things that are not within the bounds of orthodoxy. That's Catherine Corneille. She's the author of The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue. So let's dig into the five essential conditions here. First of all, how did you arrive at, at just five? Well, I was trying to think of, I'm trained phenomenologically, so I'm always looking at, at what are the essential elements that go into a particular reality or phenomenon. Uh, what cannot be left out for constructive dialogue to uh, occur. So I played with a number of conditions for a while, leaving some out, adding some, and then trying to figure out what is necessary, what is essential for constructive dialogues between religions. And those are the five conditions I came up with. I mean, other, others can, of course, contest it and add some conditions. Uh, I mean, you can say political circumstances are are important and and uh, and variables, but those are not necessarily the conditions that come from within the tradition or from within the attitude of people engaging in dialogue with each other. So, um, those are the types of conditions I was really looking for. The first condition we'll talk about here is doctrinal or epistemic humility. So here's something you write in the book. You say the impulse to dialogue arises from the desire to learn. And you say that the desire to learn presupposes humility. So this is your first precondition. So doctrinal humility has to do indeed with a recognition that there is more to learn about ultimate reality and the ultimate truth, that one does not, that any particular religion doesn't have the fullness of the understanding of truth. That doesn't mean that there, uh, that a tradition therefore relativizes its own revelation, but that the understanding of the revelation may not be complete, and that therefore uh, ways in which other religions might have uh, understood the truth about God might shed new light on one's own tradition. So there has to be some kind of dynamic orientation towards the ultimate fulfillment of the truth, whether it's at the end of time or not, but a recognition that one's own truth can still be sharpened, improved, enhanced, and that's, I think, a first condition for the possibility of learning from another religious tradition. It's interesting the way that you explicitly point out that this humility cuts in, in two directions. It's, it's humility not just about one's own tradition, but also about not knowing much about another tradition as well. There's humility that runs in different directions here. Right, but the humility about not knowing about another tradition is fairly straightforward. I mean, I think it's more common too. Yeah, and everyone knows that they don't know everything about other religious traditions. So it's 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 a quite uh, sort of obvious uh, factual reality. The kind of theological humility is much more challenging in insofar as what I pointed out before. Yeah. Every religion believes itself to have the ultimate truth. So. How do you maintain that commitment to the ultimacy of the truth of one's own tradition while recognizing that you may learn more at least about the understanding of that truth? So that's 
much more challenging than the plain fact that we don't know everything about other religions. And since you're writing from within a Catholic and Christian tradition in particular, and you say that motivations need to come from within one's own faith, then what powers humility from your standpoint then? What are you drawing on uh, to say, hey, within our tradition, this is a characteristic and a quality that we are religiously motivated to sustain? Yeah, in the Catholic tradition or in the Christian tradition in general, and in fact in most religious traditions, there's a kind of understanding of the radical transcendence of God. So God is so beyond our powers of knowing and understanding, so beyond our grasp that God is always greater than our human faculties, our human capacities for understanding. And so that what what we call in the Catholic tradition, that kind of apophasis or understanding of God as being always beyond categories of knowing is one way of recognizing or admitting that we don't know everything about God. Another area that allows for that kind of humility in the Christian tradition in general is what we call the eschatological orientation of Christianity. So there's a sense that the fulfillment of truth will only occur at the end of time and every historical understanding is temporal, partial, historical. And so there's always this dynamic orientation towards that fulfillment of truth that allows for us to learn. Yeah, and they're interesting, even scriptures that you can draw on. I mean, obviously, the book of Revelation talks about the end time, but even things like when Paul in First Corinthians is talking about, we prophesy in part, we, we do all these things in part, but there's going to come this time. Mm-hmm. You know, right now, we see through a glass darkly, or we look in an obscure mirror, but in the future. Yeah, exactly. So even Paul, who is a witness of Christ, an apostle, one of the most fundamental f- figures in Christianity, is saying... Actually, you know, I don't know everything here. Mm-hmm. What about other traditions, say Buddhism, for example? What would be an example, or or Hinduism, or something, uh, where within their tradition someone might draw on this mm-hmm. uh, to say that they should be humble? Well, Buddhism is is a religion par excellence, in fact, that sort of emphasizes the historicity, the partiality of all conventional knowledge. So they make a very sharp distinction between ultimate truth and conventional truth. And it's not that conventional truth is in, is invalid, but it is conventional. It's part of historical language and so forth. So Buddhism, more than most other traditions, recognizes the relativity, which doesn't mean relativism, but the relativity of all human uh, religious language. What would you say the difference is between that relativity and the relativism? Well, relativity points to the fact that all human knowledge is imperfect and qualified by language, history, and so forth. And your own personal upbringing. And, yeah. yeah. Relativism is that it's reduc- reducible to human understanding and knowledge. So relativism is fundamentally, I think, at odds with religious understanding if you believe that all all religion is a projection or based on historical and social circumstances, then, you know, the the transcendence of religion falls to the wayside. So relativism, I think, is irreconcilable with religious understanding. Relativity or the humility to recognize that your understanding of the truth is related to language and history and so forth is a positive and and natural way of uh, understanding. It's striking to me that you point out that some of these conditions that you lay out in the book are going to come more naturally to certain religious traditions and backgrounds than others. I do think that, yes, yeah, some conditions are more emphasized in some traditions than in, in others. And I also don't present these conditions as necessarily what every religious tradition has to obey. They're more sort of heuristic conditions that allow religions also to understand why they may not be interested in dialogue. So I gave the example of Buddhism being very apophatic or emphasizing the relativity of their understanding of the truth. On the other hand, Buddhism does not have the kind of eschatological orientation towards the fulfillment of truth. So that kind of understanding of the relativity of truth is all there is. And that can also impede interest in other religions if all religions only have sort of partial truth and the ultimate truth will never be discovered, then there's also less motivation for entering into dialogue. 
Yeah, and the more you get involved in interreligious dialogue, the more you see how complicated it can be in, in people's motivations and why they want to do it and what they bring to the table and what, mm -hmm. they, what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. That kind of leads us into the next condition as well, which is commitment to a particular religious identity. And this is a really interesting one to me because we live at a time when religious nuns, N-O-N-E, uh, or spiritual people, they say I'm spiritual but not religious, people that aren't connected to set religious traditions, these type of people are on the rise. And so your second principle of commitment seems to suggest that nuns might actually have some difficulty with interreligious dialogue. And I would expect it to be the other way, that if they're a nun, they might be more open to learning about other traditions or, or something like that. But if they don't come from a rooted position, it might be more difficult to engage. Talk about that dynamic a little bit. Yeah, I think there's a difference between that kind of engagement with different religious traditions from a non-committed or an individual perspective and the kind of commitment that I talk about to a particular religion that allows for interreligious dialogue. So you can have a kind of personal interest in different religious traditions without concern with advancing or belonging to a particular religious tradition and there you know all religions are equally true and one can pick and choose from different religions according to one's own taste and judgment but that's not interreligious dialogue that's sort of the being spiritual but not religious because they explicitly denounce any sense of belonging to any particular religious tradition. So that's where I make the distinction without necessarily judging that kind of attitude, but that's not what I understand interreligious dialogue to be. Yeah, that really helps clarify the difference between interest in other religions and interreligious dialogue. This second condition of commitment to a particular religious identity is required because that's what interreligious dialogue is about, is mm -hmm. comparing, contrasting, learning, um, and, and even disagreeing as well. It's, it's not the idea to just get everybody to think the same things. Of right? course, yeah. Um, so what other benefits does this kind of commitment to a particular religious identity bring to interreligious dialogue? I would say it allows that dialogue to go beyond one's own positioning in the world. So that kind of dialogue is not just for oneself, but it is a dialogue that one conducts in service of a larger tradition. So that kind of dialogue ultimately, hopefully, allows for the tradition itself to learn and to sometimes also grow from uh, what is taken from another religious tradition. So it allows for that dialogue to bear fruit, not just for oneself, but for the larger tradition. It also allows for that dialogue to be based not just on my own taste, but on something that has been given, a revelation, a divine truth that is given and therefore allows me to be more discerning in the dialogue of what might be true and false. I think the temptation with a kind of being spiritual but not religious is that one just picks from other religions or from religions whatever uh, suit my taste, but how true or how religious is that ultimately? There's not really any sense of surrender to a reality that is given or the truth that is given to us. It's all my truth. And to me, that sort of is, there's a fundamental tension with uh, what religion is about. Mm. Yeah. Especially, for example, Islam, right? I mean, Islam meaning surrender, and mm -hmm. it would seem really contrary to the spirit of Islam. It, for example. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't think there are too many spiritual but not religious that come out of the Muslim faith. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah even the shape of, uh, of a particular tradition uh, can help determine even people who leave that faith and some of the perspectives they have. They're usually, they usually carry aspects of the past with them in really interesting ways. Now, interreligious exchange can raise questions that a person hasn't thought of before. That can be kind of scary. So while a person brings their commitment into the exchange, they also kind of put that commitment on the line a little bit. It, this is a, a condition that can come under threat in the exchange. It can. Some scholars would go so far as to say that one has, for a true dialogue to take place, one has to be able to, willing to sacrifice everything in the dialogue and give oneself just completely to where the dialogue takes 
the partners in dialogue. I find that in some ways an unrealistic condition for dialogue. If one belongs to a particular religious tradition psychologically, one cannot imagine ever giving that up. Now, it may happen. Obviously, people do convert from one religion to the next. But, but to set that as a condition, the willingness to give up one's own convictions, if that is where the dialogue takes one, I think is just too tall an order and not necessary for a constructive dialogue to, to take place. Hmm. So you'd say it's, it's something that people can do in a religious dialogue with, but it's, it wouldn't be an essential necessary position for someone to do it. Right. With. Not a, not a necessary condition. Mm. Yeah. But the other side of that coin would be that commitment can border on missionary mindedness, like you, that you come into the dialogue hoping to change the other person. So what about that possibility? I would say that that is what dialogue is about. I, I regard dialogue as sort of mutual witnessing to the truth of one's own tradition. So it's not just mm. exchanging facts but mutual witnessing to the content and and the ultimacy of what one believes. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can take a book off the shelf and, and read about another religious tradition, whereas in dialogue, both parties attempt to convince the other of the truth of their own tradition. And that is what I think gives dialogue its, its dynamism. Also, therefore, I wouldn't distinguish dialogue too sharply from mission. I think mission is most effective if it's done in a mode of listening and communicating and dialogue is also also gains sort of momentum and energy when both parties are trying to listen and convey something important to each other so therefore i wouldn't distinguish them so sharply hmm, interesting it, and it seems like that sort of missionary mindedness um Within a religious dialogue, you would want to know more about what the other person believes, if not for anything else, than to at least establish common ground or to find a place to begin to see where you can agree on some things in addition to where you can disagree on some things. Right. And that's that leads into your very next condition, which is interconnection. This is the third condition. It's the belief that, that one's own beliefs or practices are relatable or c comparable in some way to, to a different traditions. But you say that, that this idea that your own faith could interconnect with someone else's faith is, is usually far from evident to people. Why, why do you think that is? I think to people in general, it might be more evident than to the scholarly world today. So there's a, in scholarship about, in religious studies in general, there's sort of a <clears throat> suspicion of even the use of the term religion as an overarching category mm -hmm. that it sort of imposes a kind of similarity that's not necessarily there and that every tradition is fundamentally different so that even the term religion might not be applicable. Yeah, and the way that there, even the term religion was sort of invented in the scholarly community or reinvented at the turn of the century and right. there's history to it, yeah. yeah. And there can be like a colonizing effect where I'm going to call this thing that you have religion and then I'm going to treat it like that, even though that might not necessarily fit what you're doing. Right. So there's a whole debate about the suitability of the use of the term religion that I tackle there. I think most people do have sort of a intuition that religions do have something in common with each other. People won't name that, but that there is something that they're all searching for or that they're all hoping for. So either in the motivation for being religious or else in the, f the experiences of religion that there is something that, uh, that religions share with one another. Um, in my emphasis on interconnection, the issue is that it's only if you believe that other religions, as religions have something that connects them with what you are after, that you'll be interested in dialogue with other religions. Otherwise, you know, you can enter into dialogue with, with sciences or any other area, but what is it about other religions and the common search that might make them particularly interesting dialogue partners. And it's only if you believe that you're searching for something that's relatable that, that that dialogue will happen. Now, where that aspect of connection comes from, you can see that element of connection either in common external challenges. All religions are mm -hmm. looking for 
world peace or the end of violence or the end of hunger and so on. So, Or they're afraid of like the rise of secularization. Or something. Yes, yeah. exactly. So those kinds of common external challenges can bring religions together. Uh, you can also find a sort of common ground in a belief that all religions come out of the same experience or are oriented towards the same experience. A good number of scholars in the beginning of the 20th century were really fascinated with the universality of religious experiences Just and like so Houston forth. Smith and exactly. William James and people yeah. like that, yeah. Ananda Kumar Swami, mm -hmm. uh, Aldous Huxley and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that can be a, a ground for, for engaging other religious traditions. The point I'm trying to make is that each religion has to find also, in addition to that, a point of interconnection that comes out of their own theological thinking. Right. So the example I give is in the Christian tradition, the idea that the revelation of God continues in history and that God's spirit can be at work in other religious traditions. So if that is part of Christian belief, then it's not only possible but necessary, I would say, to engage other religious traditions if you really believe that God's spirit may be at work in those religions to see how that occurs and what we can learn from that. That's Catherine Cornell. She's the author of The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue, and she recently presented the 2018 Truman G. Madsen Lecture on the Eternal Man here at Brigham Young University. That's sponsored by the Wheatley Institution, who uh, brought Catherine Cornell here to Brigham Young University. She's also done a lot of things. Uh, she's the founding and managing editor of a book series, Christian Commentaries on Non-Christian Sacred Texts. And from 2008 to 2015, she also edited volumes on critical issues in interreligious dialogue. So a lot of publications on, on this topic. Let's talk about the next condition here, uh, number four, which is intellectual and experiential empathy. And this is the main theme of the lecture that you gave through the Wheatley Institution. You say that empathy is one of the most basic requirements of all. Why is that? Well, interreligious dialogue is, as I said just before, a matter of exchanging not only the content of what one believes, but also one's own deep experience and faith. And so in understanding people from other religious traditions, the process of understanding has to do not only with knowing particular facts about the other religion, but also trying to enter into their uh, experiential world and and grasping the meaning, the existential meaning of particular elements of faith and how those beliefs and practices affect people's way of being and life in general. So it's an aspect of interreligious understanding that has come to be neglected a bit in the study of religion, at least because of the fact that it's such a difficult capacity to get a hold of. Uh, empathy is more often compared to an art rather than a science, and it's very difficult to control or to direct. It's emotional. And it's affective. Yeah, it's emotional. But religion is about emotions. Mm -hmm. Religion is about that affective dimension of life. And so to understand the other, we have to at least try to understand the affective dimension of their beliefs. And so that's where the aspect of, of empathy comes in. My argument in, in that chapter is not so much that perfect empathy is possible, but that it's only in trying to understand the other, enter into their religious experience, that one gains something extra or more from, from the dialogue. And it's only if one is able to resonate in some way with uh, what one understands intellectually about another religion that one might move from understanding to also trying to learn from the other religious tradition. If there's something in that one resonates with in the other tradition that one feels might be lacking in one's own religious tradition, then one will move 
further and try to incorporate those elements possibly within one's own religious tradition. Yeah, I, I think in the book as well, in the chapter on empathy, you have a, a really specific definition here that I wanted to read as well. It says, empathy consists of a transposition into the religious life of the other by identifying with the worldview, the belief system, and the ritual practices of the other in order to resonate with the spiritual impact of particular teachings on the life of a believer. You're almost inviting people then to imaginatively become the person that they're talking to and what it would be like to be in that tradition and have that belief and do those practices. Exactly. So that's, I think, an important dimension of dialogue. Again, one that is difficult to control and difficult to achieve. But I think in just stretching oneself and trying to enter into the life world of the other, one gains very important information or experience that that is, I think, constitutive of, of genuine dialogue. Have you had any negative experiences trying to do that as you've uh, dialogued with people from different traditions? Has it ever been a painful experience or a... Well, I think by negative, I would, under, I would understand that I was just unable to enter into their life mm -hmm. world and uh, and understand I effectively what the impact is of particular rituals or beliefs on their life. So that is also what I spoke about in the lecture, namely limits of interreligious empathy. I think there are all kinds of factors that may contribute to empathy, but that can also inhibit empathic resonance with the other. And I can give all kinds of examples of yeah. things that Let's I... Let's hear one. For example, uh, I've been studying Hinduism for, for a very long time, and in Hinduism there's a very strong belief that uh, that the spirit of the god or that the, the, the god, him or herself, is fully present in the image. Like in a little statue or in a... In a statue, thing, right? yeah. and so the statue is, is fed and put to bed and clothed and taken on a walk or a pilgrimage around the temple and so on. It's housed in a temple for it, and that is where the god is. That's yeah. right. So there's a kind of ecstasy also in believers when they suddenly see the god. So if the god is taken on a walk around the temple in a procession, for example, you hear, you know, people screaming and, you know, uh, dancing when they see the God because it's such a overwhelming experience for them. And so, you know, I've been studying Hinduism for 30 years, and but that is an experience that I have never been able to resonate with myself. And I think it's very telling also that I'm not able to resonate with that experience because one of the essential elements of any religious experience is faith, you know, belief that what you believe is really true. And of course, me not believing that that is true, I think, prevents me from feeling that excitement and and resonating in those kinds of ways. Well, well forgive me for this. Th that surprises me because you come from a Catholic tradition and Catholicism has the real presence in the host. So the belief that the body of Christ is really is really there, not just symbolically as Protestantism and other traditions have the, the bread and the wine or water or whatever people use symbolizes that, but it's real. And also Catholics have a lot of places of pilgrimage where they'll go and see a saint or relics where these, this is the bone of a saint. You know, I, I talked with Robert Orsi about this. There's such a strong tradition of real presence that coming from a Latter-day Saint background, I, I, I was astounded at, at the literalness of those represences. So for, as a Catholic, then you, you see s sort of similar things happening in Hinduism, but you, you're having a hard time wrapping your head around it. So right. tell me more. I think it's maybe the abstractness of the host. So the only place, the only element of comparison, I would say, would be the Eucharist. So the images of saints and so on, I, I don't think that that compares. The Eucharist from a Catholic perspective and the idea of transubstantiation of the bread and the wine, that would be as close as one would get to the idea of the murti or the God being really present in the image. But that's also telling, I think, in terms of how it's not just 
the analogy itself, but it's the element of faith in that particular thing uh -huh. that I'm missing. So I can think sort of by way of, okay, that's similar to, to what I experience with the host. I think there are a few differences in that there's a kind of abstraction in the host that the image that uh, that is not quite the same as as an as a statue. Yeah, where I guess the, God the host is fully doesn't change present. shape, for example, right? Like it still looks like what it did before. Whereas with these, maybe with these statues and stuff, like that is the thing. That is it. Maybe that is the God. Yeah, but it's also I, in some ways the statue is in some ways more literal. You know, the host has something symbolic to it uh, still. And you know, it's miraculous. It's, and it, yeah, yeah. It's, it refers to something still beyond itself. And it's not like a body. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't become a piece of body right. in, before yeah. your eyes. Yeah. Right. So, okay. so that kind of symbolism, I think, allows more of a distance. Yeah. Whereas, like, really believing that the statue is God. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and again, what's... Uh, difficult about empathy is that it's so personal. So I may, as a Catholic, not be able to empathize with certain experience that another Catholic is, is able to empathize with. And the example I often give is of a colleague of mine who's a professor of anthropology and theology at my, at my university in Leuven, and he worked a lot with the Maasai in Africa. And one of the most difficult things for me to understand is also spirit possession. Mm -hmm. So people who suddenly feel like they are possessed by a spirit mm -hmm. and no longer in control of their body and mind and speak in different voices and languages and do different things that they're not in control of. So that kind of experience I have never had mm -hmm. and I have no personal resonance with when I observe it or when I hear about it. But my colleague, who's a Catholic, also a professor, also very rational, uh, has worked with the Maasai, lived mm. with the Maasai, and he says he has no problem at all mm. empathizing with that experience mm. that when he is actually with the Maasai, he has it himself, uh, that kind of experience of spirit possession. So, so that shows how uh, difficult a capacity it, it is to get a complete hold of or to control. Uh, there are certain factors that contribute to empathy uh, and that I spoke of in my lecture also, but ultimately it's a sort of a mystery mm. uh, how that works. Yeah, so people will want to check out that lecture. Um, we'll provide a link to that uh, when it's available. It's the Truman G. Matson Lecture on Eternal Man, sponsored by the Wheatley Institution. So empathy leads into your final condition, which is hospitality. How would you differentiate those two from each other? So hospitality is, again, uh, much more theological or theoretical category, and it has more to do with an appreciation of the possible truth of another religious tradition. So not just resonating with, but allowing for the possibility that there might be truth in another religion that one might learn from. So this is really what I call the sufficient condition for dialogue. The other conditions I call necessary, but this one the very fact that one believes that there may be truth in another religious tradition should compel believers to engage that other tradition. So, but that has to be established again from within one's own religious tradition. So that kind of hospitality or generosity towards the possibility of finding truth in another religious tradition is different from humility, but the two together, I think, in finding truth in another religious tradition, one then tends to become more humble about one's own religious tradition. And it's only through humility about one's own truth that one will create enough openness to finding truth in another tradition. So these are conditions that can mutually reinforce each other. Exactly. So hospitality, I mean, it's not just being nice, inviting someone in, giving them a nice, comfortable chair, a cool glass of water. It, it seems to require, in what you're saying, an openness, the, the possibility that you have something to learn from someone else, that someone else has something genuine and distinctive from your own tradition or belief that, that you don't actually have. But you say that's su a sufficient condition, so it's a good thing to have, but it, it's not a deal breaker if someone doesn't have that. Is that is that right? No, by sufficient, I mean something quite uh, th the opposite, that just believing 
that the other has something that is distinctive and true is enough, sufficient, enough to motivate oneself to engage with, with the other mm -hmm. or should compel one to engage with the other. So it can actually trickle back through the other conditions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the other conditions contribute to it, but just that in itself, you know, just me thinking that you have something that I don't know and that is important for me to know will drive me to speak to you and to hear more of what you have to say. Mm -hmm. That alone is enough to, for me to want to speak to you. Uh, so that's what I mean by sufficient condition for, for dialogue. But that, again, tends to not come naturally to religious traditions and, and requires religions to find sources within their own tradition that recognize the other religion as a source of distinctive truth. So most religions have no problem recognizing truth in other religions that is the same as what they already believe. So that's uncontroversial. Mm -hmm. But what would be necessary for genuine dialogue is to go further and to allow for the possibility that the other religion might have truth that I don't know. And so that kind of excess truth that that will benefit me and my tradition, that's really what is at the, at the origin or what motivates dialogue in the most explicit or strongest way. Is there a significant example that you can think of where you have experienced this type of hospitality, where you have received something from another tradition or, or someone that you were talking with that, that changed your own personal faith or that contributed something to your own personal faith that Catholicism hadn't given you? Well, as I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, I was uh, from a very young age already quite interested in, in Asian traditions and certain practices that they have developed that allow us as Christians maybe to live up to our own faith. And I'm thinking particularly about the way in which those traditions have understood the working of the mind and the control of the mind. So uh, there are many Christian teachings that are very important to me, but that the tradition itself has not fully developed in terms of how to live up to the ideal of dying to oneself, for example, or all of the teachings of Christianity that have to do with love of neighbor and overcoming one's own selfish attachments and so on, uh, how to attain that state of perfection that Jesus calls for in Matthew chapter 5 and 6. So I think Christianity sets a very high bar of, of, uh, for purity of heart and, and mind, but how to attain that kind of purity I think is, uh, is something where Christianity might learn from other religions that have maybe developed a stronger understanding of how the mind works in terms of selfish desires and attachments and what kind of techniques might help us to overcome these, these attachments. So for me, you know, the Buddhist meditation, Hindu practices of yoga, all of those kinds of religious disciplines, I think, can help us as Christians to live up to our own highest goals. And that's uh, uh, an example of where I've really recognized in another tradition something new and distinctive. Mm, thank you. Do you have any advice for people who are reluctant to engage in interreligious dialogue to someone who says, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd be comfortable doing that or I'm, I'm afraid uh, of doing that or I don't even need to do that? Uh, I think all of the major religions of the world have survived because they have given meaning and purpose to people's lives and allowed people to deepen and, and grow in their relationship to God. And so just out of a humanistic orientation of, of, try, of wanting to understand how other human beings have understood ultimate reality, I think, is uh, that's, that's, I think, already a basic motivation for one's curiosity and interest in, in other religious traditions. But other than that, I think 
every religious tradition from my own point of view is is limited uh, they they you can still believe in the superiority of your own tradition. So for people who are afraid of interreligious dialogue because it might lead to relativism, I think you can still believe in, in the fact that your religion is superior, but that doesn't mean that other religions don't have elements that your religion has not understood with the same kind of depth and, and sophistication of your tradition. So. I think just out of uh, curiosity and interest in other human beings, but also in ultimate reality itself, I, I don't think there's any reason to fear other religious traditions if you are strong enough in your own faith. And sometimes the very uh, fact that dialogue may question your own commitment is a good thing. It may sort of make your own commitment more real and more profound and purify your own sense of uh, religious understanding. And what have you been working on since this book came out and maybe talk about what's coming up for you? So just last week I organized a major conference on atonement and comparative theology where I invited major Christian comparative theologians who have been working uh, in other religious traditions to reflect on how that engagement with other religions can shed new light on the Christian understanding of atonement or the vicarious suffering of Christ. And so I am hoping to publish those papers, which were brilliant. And then I myself, just this past summer, finished a book on meaning and method in comparative theology. So comparative theology is the systematic theological engagement with another religious tradition. And that has been developing in the Christian tradition for the past 20 or 30 years. And different comparative theologians have done it in different ways. Uh, so there's a bit of confusion about what comparative theology is. And so what I try to do in the, in the book is develop a kind of systematic exposition of what comparative theology is, what comparative theological hermeneutics is, how to do it, and so forth. What, what different types of learning are and so forth. And where can people expect to see that? Who's going to be putting that out? Uh, Wiley uh, is publishing that uh, in the spring of 2019. That's Catherine Corneille. She earned her PhD in religious studies from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium, and she's the author of The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue. Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. You're welcome. And I want to say, too, uh, the way that you would respond to a lot of my questions, I think, really reflected sustained engagement in, in interreligious conversation. I hope this interview helps people understand what interreligious dialogue can do, but I hope that it also can serve as an example of constructive dialogue and, and respectful engagement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Maximal Institute podcast. And as always, we have a transcript of this episode available at mi.byu.edu. Our review of the month this time comes from Hawaii Boy in Texas. Hawaii Boy in Texas says, Blair Hodges does a wonderful job, great guests, informative, thought-provoking, and inspiring. Kudos also to Terrell Givens for his knowledge and insights. Thank you so much for that kind review. Let's get some more reviews. If you haven't reviewed the show yet, you can do so in iTunes. It's one of the very best ways to spread word about the show to other people. Your recommendations make this podcast grow. We'll see you next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast.